everybody, this is Mrs. Lingham. Welcome back. Okay, sixth graders, you know the drill. Today we're going to be looking at one of my favorite books, Esperanza Rising. Today we're on chapter six, which is called Los Melones. All right, so if you want to join me on page 81, let's get started. They reached the border at Mexicali in the morning. Finally, the train stopped moving and everyone disembarked. The land was dry and the panorama was barren except for date palms, cactus, and the occasional squirrel or roadrunner. The conductors heard ev excuse me, the conductors herded everyone into the building where they stood in their long lines waiting to pass through emigration. Esperanza noticed that the people in the first cars were es escorted to the shortest lines and passed through quickly. Okay, now if you'll take a thought for a minute and think about what we learned in history. Remember when we talked about immigration, when everyone was coming through um, the port at New York City and they had so many people in the immigration lines. So why do you think in this particular instance, the people who were in the first cars maybe got to go into the shorter lines? Was it because they were rich? Was it because they were lighter skin color? Is this an example of segregation maybe in a different way? Because remember, the influx of people coming into the United States at this time was just really gigantic. And so there was a lot of different weeding processes that were happening to keep quite so many people from coming across. And so this right here is just another example of that immigration crisis that was happening in the 1920s. Inside, the air was stagnant and thick with the smell of body odor. Esperanza and Mama, their faces shiny with grime and perspiration, looked tired and whittled as they slumped, <clears throat> as they slumped with even the slight weight of their valises. The closer Esperanza got to the front, the more nervous she became. She looked at her papers and hoped that they were in order. What if the officials found something wrong? Would they send her back to her uncles? Would they arrest her and put her in jail? She reached the desk and handed over the documents. The immigration official seemed angry for no reason. Where are you coming from? She looked at Mama, who was behind her. We are from Agua Calientes, said Mama, stepping forward. And what's the purpose of entering for entering the United States? Esperanza was afraid to speak. What if she said something wrong? To work, said Mama, handing him her documents as well. What work, demanded the man. Mama's demeanor changed. She stood up straight and tall and deliberately blotted her face with her handkerchief. She looked directly into the official's eyes and spoke calmly as if she were giving a simple direction to a servant. I'm sure you can see that everything is in order. The name of the employer is written there. The people are expecting us. The man studied Mama. He looked at their faces, then the pages, and then their faces again. Standing tall and proud, Mama never took her eyes from his face. Why was it taking so long? Finally, he grabbed the stamp and pounded each page with the words, Mexican National. He shoved the papers at them and waved them through. Mama took Esperanza's hand and hurried her towards another train. They boarded and waited for an hour for all of the passengers to get through immigration. Esperanza looked out the window. Across the tracks, several groups of people were being prodded into another train headed back towards Mexico. Now, if you look at that wording there, that the people were prodded back into the train. If you are familiar with any type of livestock work, you'll know that when they move cattle around, they use something called a cattle prod, and nowadays it's an electric shock that you know will shock the cow to make them move. But back in the day, they would use like a pointed stick, or they would use something that maybe had uh, was hot at the end, uh, and they would push it on the rumps of the cows to get them to move in certain directions. So that's not what they're doing to the people here. They're not shoving them with sharp sticks or hot sticks, but it does give you an idea about how these Mexican nationals are being treated. Um, so what it's going to tell us here in the next little bit is that these are the people who did not make it into the United States, and we learned about that in history as well. But you can see that the wording here shows us that the immigration officials were not treating these immigrants as people. They were being treated more like animals and they were being prodded and pushed into these cars, kind of like livestock, which is a really sad image. My heart aches for these people. They came all this way just to be sent back, said Mama. But why? asked Esperanza. For many reasons. They had no papers, false ones, or no proof of work. There might have been a problem with just one member of the family, and they all chose to go back instead of being separated. Esperanza thought about being separated from Mama and gratefully took her hand and squeezed it. Almost everyone had boarded except Alfonso, Hortensia, and Miguel. Esperanza kept looking for them, and she became more anxious with each passing minute. Mama, where are they? 
Mama said nothing, but Esperanza could see the worry in her eyes, too. Finally, Hortensia got on. The train's engines began to chug. Her voice tense, Esperanza said, What happened to Alfonso and Miguel? Hortensia pointed out the window. They had to find some water. Okay, now why do you think that uh, Miguel and Alfonso had to find water? Think about that mysterious package that they have, that they keep having to bring back and forth and back and forth. What do you think is in it? What do you think it symbolizes? And why would it need water? Is it an animal? Is it a plant? Is it something else mysterious? Alfonso was running towards the train with Miguel close behind, waving the secret pack package and grinning. The train slowly started moving as they hopped on. Esperanza wanted to be angry at them for making her anxious. She wanted to yell at them for waiting until the very last minute, just so they could find water for their package that was probably nonsense anyway. But looking from one to the other, she sat back, limp with relief, happy to have them all together and surrounding her, and surprised that she could be so glad to be back on a train. Anza, we're here, wake up! She sat up groggily, barely opening her eyes. What day is this? she asked. You've been asleep for hours. Wake up! It's Thursday, and we're here in Los Angeles. Look, there they are, said Alfonso, pointing out the window. My brother, Juan, and Josefina, excuse me, Josefina, his wife, and the children, Isabel and the twins. They have all come. The Campancino family waved to them. Juan and Josefina each held their baby, a year old, in their arms. It was easy to see that the man was Alfonso's brother, even though he didn't have a mustache. So think about that wording right there. Of course, that's imagery saying that it was easy to tell that the man was Alfonso's brother. But what is it actually saying? It's saying they looked very similar. They had very similar facial traits and very similar facial features that you could look at them and tell that they were related. Joseph, Josefina was plump with a round face and a complexion that was fairer than Esperanza's. She was smiling and waving with her free hand. Next to her stood a girl about eight years old, wearing a dress that was too big and shoes with no, no, with no socks. Delicate and frail, with big brown eyes, long braids, and skinny legs, she looked like a young deer. Esperanza couldn't help but think how much she looked like the doll that Papa had given her. Okay, now here's another example of imagery. If you look, it describes um, this little girl as looking like a young deer. So automatically, we kind of get this idea that maybe she's innocent. Maybe she's very curious. If you've ever seen a fawn, when they walk up to you, their eyes are real big, and they like to sniff you and that kind of thing, kind of like any new animal, a newborn animal, rather, or a baby animal. And so it kind of depicts her as this very innocent, very curious creature. We're on the page 86. There was much hugging all around the relatives. Alfonso said, Everyone, this is Senora Ortega and Esperanza. Alfonso, please call me Ramona. Yes, of course, Senora. My family feels like they know you because we have all written letters about you for years. Mama hugged Juan and Josefina and said, Thank you for all you have done for us already. Miguel teased his cousin, pulling her braids. Esperanza, this is Isabel. Isabel looked at Esperanza, her eyes wide with wonder, and in a voice that was soft and whispery, she said, Were you really so very wealthy? Did you always get your way? And did you have all the dolls and fancy dresses that you wanted? Okay, now remember, it describes this little girl as very innocent. So she's asking some pretty re rude words, um, not words, uh, questions to Esperanza. And you have to really think about it. I mean, would you say those questions to somebody, walk up to somebody rich and be like, why are you so rich? Why do you always get your way? We as adults and as young adults, we don't ask those kinds of questions because we recognize that they're rude. But a younger child who doesn't have that same social boundary doesn't know that it's rude to ask those questions. So by describing this little girl as a deer who is very um, innocent and very curious, it makes us understand that when she's asking these questions, she's not asking them because uh, she's angry or because she's trying to be rude herself. She's genuinely curious, and those are the things that she's heard. All right, page 87. Esperanza's mouth was pressed into an irritated line. She could only imagine the letters that Miguel had written. Had he told Isabel that in Mexico they stood on different sides of the river? The truck is this way, said Juan. We have a long ride. Esperanza picked up her valise, valise and followed Isabel's father. She looked around and was relieved to see that, the, that compared to the desert, Los Angeles had lush palms and green grass, and even though it was September, 
Roses were still blooming in the flower beds. She took a deep breath. The aroma of oranges from nearby groves was reassuring and familiar. Maybe it wouldn't be so different here. Now, do you think that's going to be true? She's finding some similarities between um, her ranch back in Mexico and this new place where she's going, but do you really think that it's going to be that similar? Juan, Josefina, and Mama, and Hortensia crowded into the front seat of a rickety truck. Isabel, Esperanza, Alfonso, and Miguel sat in the truck bed with the babies and two red and the two red hens. The vehicle looked like it should be hauling animals instead of people, but Esperanza had said nothing to Mama. Besides, after so many days on the train, it felt good to stretch out her legs. Now, it might seem weird to us in our day and culture to see kids riding in the bed of a truck, especially with babies and with chickens and everything, but you have to remember, at this time, there were actually no seatbelt laws. They didn't know about um, the different dangers that would be posed um, during wrecks and things like that. So it was actually allowed for people to ride in the backs of trucks, especially if you were on the highway. I mean, it just it was a way to carry people. And so that wasn't considered something that was dangerous or uh, frowned upon even. So it's kind of an interesting cultural connection to make. The old jalopity rocked and swayed as if it climbed out of the San Fernando Valley, waving up through the hills covered with dried out shrubs. She sat with her back against the cab, and the hot wind whipped her loose hair. Alfonso tried to tie a blanket across the wooden slats to make a canopy of shade. The babies, Lupe and Pepe, a girl and a boy, were dark-haired cherubs with a thick mop of black hair. Esperanza was surprised at how much they looked alike. The only difference was the tiny gold earrings in Lupe's ears. Pepe crawled into Esperanza's lap and Lupe into Isabel's. When the, babies, when the baby fell asleep against Esperanza, his head slid down her arm, leaving a stream of perspiration. Is it always so hot here? she asked. My papa says it's the dry air that makes it so hot, and sometimes it's even hotter, said Isabel. But it's better than living in El Centro, because now we do not have to live in a tent. A tent? Last year we worked for another farm in El Centro, in the Imperial Valley, not too far away from the border, and we were there during the melons. We lived in a tent with a dirt floor and had to carry water. We cooked outside, but then we moved north to Arvin. This is where we're going now. A big company owns the camp. We pay $7 a month, and Papa says it's worth it to have piped in cold water and electricity and a kitchen inside. He says the farm is 6,000 acres. Okay, now that was a lot of information that Isabella just gave us. Now you have to remember, migrant families they did not normally have a lot of money so apparently um the way that this group of people is telling time has to do with the seasons so if you'll notice this particular chapter was called La, los melones which literally means the melons and so if you think about that um you can know that this time of september is going to be the melon harvest so we're going to keep time throughout this story having to do with the different fruit and the different crops that are produced at that time um, we're on page 89. Uh, where did it go? I lost my place. Isabel leaned towards Esperanza and grinned as if she were telling a big secret. And a school. Next week, I get to go to school, and I will learn to read. Can you read? Of course, said Esperanza. Will you go to school? asked Isabel. I went to a private school, and I started when I was four, so I've already passed through level eight. When my grandmother comes, maybe I will go to high school. Well, when I go to school, I will learn English, said Isabel. Esperanza nodded and tried to smile back. Isabel was so happy, she thought, about such little things. So why do you think that Isabel and Esperanza have this big difference in their, in their perspective? Because Isabel is looking at her life as a tent and looking at her life in here as these big grand things and how she's so excited to have water inside of her house and she's just blah, 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 excited to go to school and excited all these things and Esperanza is definitely not excited about those things. She's not excited to live in a small town. She's not ex excited to live in a small house. And uh, you can tell definitely the perspective here has to do with their different life experiences. You have to remember that everyone experiences life differently. What might be a tragedy for one person might not be a tragedy for another. And what might be really hard for one person might be easy for another. It all has to do with perspective. But as Esperanza is going to learn, gratefulness is a really important perspective to have. The brown, barren mountains rose higher, and a red-tailed hawk seemed to follow them for miles. The truck rattled up a steep grade past sparse, dry canyons, and Esperanza's ears began to feel full and tight. How much longer? 
We will stop for lunch soon, said Isabel. They wove through the golden hills, softly sculpted with rounded tops, until Juan finally showed, slowed the truck and turned down a side road. They came to an area shaded by a single tree. They piled out of the truck, and Josefina spread a blanket on the ground, then unwrapped a bundle of burritos, avocados, and grapes. They sat in the shade and ate. Mama Hortensia and Josefina chatted and watched the babies while Isabel lay down on the blanket between Alfonso and Juan. She was soon asleep. Esperanza wandered away from the group, grateful not to be rocking in a train or a truck. Excuse me, or in a truck or a train. She walked to an overlook. Below canyons plunged into the Aro, the silver line of water from an unknown river. It was quiet and peaceful, and the silence was broken only by the swish of dried grasses from the wind. With her feet solid on the ground for the first time in days, Esperanza remembered what Papa had taught her when she was little. If she lay on the land and was very still and quiet, she could hear the heartbeat of the valley. Can I hear it from here, Papa? She stretched out on her stomach and reached her arms to the side, hugging the earth. She let the stillness settle upon her, and she listened. She heard nothing. Be patient, she reminded herself, and the fruit will fall in your hand. She listened again, but the heartbeat was not there. She tried one more time, desperately wanting to hear it, but there was no reassuring thump repeating itself, no sound of the earth's heartbeat or Papa's. There was only the prickly sound of dry grass. Determined, Esperanza pressed her ear harder to the ground. I can't hear it. I can't hear it, she pounded the earth. Let me hear it. Tears burst from her eyes as if someone had squeezed an overripe orange. Confusion and uncertainty spilled forth and became an arro of their own. She rolled on her back, the tears worming down, the, da, worming down her face into her ears, seeing nothing but the vast sky in dizzying squirrel, swirls of blue and white. She began to feel as if she were floating and drifting upward. She lifted higher, and part of her liked the sensation, but another part of her felt untethered and frightened. She tried to find the place in her heart where her life was anchored, but she couldn't, so she closed her eyes and pressed her palms of her hands against the earth, making sure it was there. Okay, so think about the way she's feeling. It says that she feels untethered. Have you ever felt that way? Like everything that you knew and everything that was certain in your life is just suddenly not there. And that's the way Esperanza's feeling because she's had to leave her home, she's had to leave her family, she's lost her father, and she's completely changed her way of life. No longer is she in the upper class, now she's the working class, and she's having a really hard time with self-identification, knowing who she is. And I think it'd be safe to say that any of us put in that situation might feel the same way. She felt as if she were falling, careering, no, how does that say, Karen, Karening. I have it circled because I was supposed to look it up and I forgot. I'm sorry, I'll have to look that one up. She felt as if she were falling, careening through the hot air. She perspired and she felt cold and nauseous. She took short breaths, heaving in and out. Suddenly, the world went black. Someone hovered over her. She sat up quickly. How long had she been in the darkness? Her head, excuse me, she held her pounding chest and looked up at Miguel. Anza, are you all right? She took a deep breath and brushed off her dress. Had she really floated above the earth? Had Miguel seen her? She knew her face was red and blotchy. I'm fine, she said quickly, wiping the tears from her face. Don't tell Mama. You know, she worries. Miguel nodded. He sat down close to her. Without asking any questions, he took her hand and stayed with her, the quiet interrupted only by the occasional staki staccato? staccato breath. I don't know what that means, but I will look that one up too. Again... You can see here that those words are circled in my book, and I should have looked those up prior to reading. I'm so sorry, but in the next video, I'll make sure to let you guys know what those words, how to pronounce them, and what they mean. I miss him too, Miguel whispered, sneezing in her hand. I miss the ranch in Mexico and Abuelita, everything. I am sorry about what Isabel said to you. I meant nothing by it. She stared at the dark brown and purple ridges, staggering in the distance, and let the ripe tears cascade down her cheeks. And this time, Esperanza did not let go of Miguel's hand. So tell me, now that they're in the United States, are Miguel and Esperanza still on different sides of the river, or has that level playing field kind of been set? They were heading down a steep grade on Highway 99 when Isabel said, Look! Esperanza leaned around the side of the truck. 
As they rounded a curve, it appeared as if the mountains pulled away from each other, like a curtain opening on a stage, revealing San Joaquin Valley beyond. Flat and spacious, it spread out like a blanket of patchwork fields. Esperanza could see no end to the plots of yellow, brown, and shades of green. The road finally leveled out on the valley floor, and she gazed back at the mountains from where they'd come. They looked like monstrous lion paws resting at the edge of the ridge. Okay, this page 94 is full of metaphors and similes and examples of personification and examples of imagery. So in the questions that ask you about some of those examples, feel free to reference, pa reference page 94 if you can't find any others. Now, this whole chapter is going to be full of those particular um, parts of, of speech, but um, this page has a lot of examples on it as well. A big truck blew its horn and Juan pulled over to let it pass, its bed bulging with cantaloupes. Another truck and another did the same. A caravan of trucks passed them, all piled high with round melons. On one side of the highway, across of excuse me, and start over that over again. On one side of the highway, acres of grapevines stretched out in soldiered rows and swallowed up the arbors. On the other side, fields and fields of dark green cotton plants became a sea of milk white puffs. This was not a gently rolling landscape like Agua Calientes, for as far as the eye could travel, the land was unbroken by even a excuse me, the land was unbroken by even a hillock. Esperanza felt dizzy looking at the repeated straight rows of grapes and had to turn her head away. They finally turned east off the main highway. The truck went slower now, and Esperanza could see workers in the fields. People waved and Juan honked the truck horn in return. Then he pulled the truck to the side of the road and pointed to a field that had been cleared of its harvest. Dried, rambling vines covered the acre and leftover melons dotted the ground. The field markers are down. We can take as many as we can carry, he called back to them. Alfonso jumped out, tossed a dozen cantaloupes to Miguel, and then stepped up to the running board and slapped the top of the truck for Juan to start again. The melons, warmed by the valley sun, rolled and somersaulted with each bump of the truck. So what's happening is as the fields are being cleared and as the fields are having everything harvested, um, whatever was left over by the harvesters, once those fields are cleared, um, the workers could go in and glean from the fields and take anything that they wanted. So this is actually a biblical principle that's really cool that this, um, that this farm is doing. But the Bible actually said that when you glean a field, um, back in Bible days, when you were to harvest a field, that you were to leave the edges of the field and you were to leave little pieces in between um, so that those people who were either the workers or the poor could go through and they could get food from, the, from your harvest. And so anyway, it's really cool that this particular company is allowing them to do that. So there was leftover melons from the harvest. And so for every crop that is there in this particular farm, they're allowed to go back and glean what was left over after the harvest. Page 95. Two girls walking along the road waved and Juan stopped again. One of them climbed in, a girl about Miguel's age. Her hair was short, black, and curly, and her features were sharp and pointed. She leaned back against the bed of the truck, her hands behind her head, and she studied Esperanza, her eyes darting at Miguel whenever she could. This is Martha, said Isabel. She lives at another camp where they pick cotton, but it is owned by a different company. Her aunt and uncle live at our camp, so she stays with them sometimes. Where are you from? asked Martha. Agua Caliente, El Rancho de las Rosas, said Esperanza. I have never heard of El Rancho de las Rosas. Is that a town? It was the ranch that they lived on, said Isabel proudly, her eyes round and shining. Esperanza's father owned it in several acres of land. She had lots of servants and beautiful dresses, and she went to a private school, too. Miguel is my cousin, and he and his parents worked for them. So you're a princess who's come to be a peasant? Where's all your finery? Esperanza stared at her and said nothing. What's the matter? Silver spoon stuck in your mouth? Her voice was smart and biting. A fire destroyed everything. She and her mother have come to work, like the rest of us, said Miguel. Confused, Isabella added, Esperanza's nice. Her papa died. Well, my father died too, said Martha. Before he came to this country, he fought in the Mexican Revolution against people like her father who owned all the land. Esperanza stared back at Martha, unblinking. What had she done to deserve this girl's insults? Through gritted teeth, she said, You know nothing of my papa. He was good, a kind man who gave much of his property to his servants. That might be so, said Martha, 
but there were are but there were plenty of rich who did not that was not my papa's fault isabel pointed to one of the fields trying to change the subject these people are filipinos she said they live in their own camp and see over there she pointed to a field down the road those people are from oklahoma they live in camp eight there's a japanese camp too we all live separate and work separate they don't mix us okay. they don't want us banding together for higher wages or for better housing said martha the owners think if mexicans have no hot water that we won't mind as long as we think no one else has any and they don't want us talking to the okies from oklahoma or anyone else because we might discover that they have hot water see do the okies have hot water asked miguel not yet but if they get it we will strike strike said miguel you mean you will stop working don't you need your job of course i need my job but if all the workers join together and refuse to work we might all get better conditions okay so remember when we were talking about in history class and we talked about all the different segregation of workers and just the segregation of america in general it's even here segregated in the workforce so you can see that the oklahoma people from oklahoma because remember this is there during the time of the dust bowl when everyone uh, was really poor and there wasn't enough rain and all of those the different things and then you have people from the philippines coming over you're probably having some chinese people and here you have the mexican nationals and all the different people groups they're all being kept separate because they do not want them to band together because there's power in numbers and remember in history when we talked about the great strikes that had to do with the work unions and the different better pay and um, all of those different things so what they're proposing here is a union remember we talked about the unions and how they had the codes the child worker codes and all of that and so this is the beginning of this in California are the conditions so bad asked Miguel some are decent the place they're going to is one of the better ones they have fiestas there's a Jamica on this Saturday night. Isabel turned to Esperanza. Oh, you will love it. They have them every Saturday night during the summer. There is music and food and dancing. And this Saturday is the last for the year because soon it will be too cold. Esperanza nodded and tried to pay attention to Isabel. Martha and Miguel talked and grinned back and forth. An unfamiliar feeling gripped the back. Uh, an unfamiliar feeling was creeping up inside of Esperanza. She wanted to toss Martha out of the moving truck, and she scolded Miguel for even talking to her. Hadn't he seen her rudeness? She brooded as they rode past the miles of young tamarisk trees that seemed to be at the border of someone's property. Hold on, let me close this door. Beyond those trees is a Mexican camp, said Isabel, where we will live. Martha smirked at Esperanza and said, just so you know, this isn't Mexico. No one will be waiting on you here. Then she gave her a phony smile and said, Entiendes? Understand? <laughs> Esperanza stared back at her in silence. The one thing she did understand was that she did not like Martha. Okay, guys, that is the end of chapter six. And we ended on page 99. So go back and look at the questions and answer those to the very best of your ability. Remember to restate your question. That means if I ask what is a simile, you're going to say a simile is, and then you're going to give your example. Remember to read the questions carefully. Make sure you're answering all parts of the questions and just do your best. I miss all of you and I love y'all and I can't wait to have you back in the next video when we do the next chapter, which is going to be Las Cabeas. No, let me try that again. Las Cebollas, las cebollas. I believe that means the onions. So, anyway, we'll be doing that next time, and I hope to see you soon. Bye.